basically like if Ethereum completely failed and the only thing to come out of the entire Ethereum experience was ENS, I would consider Ethereum to have been a, like a wild success. Like ENS is the thing we need. Payment processing, like smart contracts, that's all really cool. But like, e, like a actual meaningful decentralized like naming service, um, epic. Hey, Rick, how are you? Pretty good. How are you? I'm really excited about how festive your background is. And thank you so much for talking to me so close to Christmas as well. Yes, yes. No worries. <laughs> um, and so I guess Rick Moon or ETH, I would love to maybe get a quick intro uh, on ethers, And then we could also just like go back to like your crypto Web3 story because I feel like ethers is one of the most beloved kind of projects within (laughs) web3 and i've only been in the space you know for 2021 but i i'm so excited as i've kind of become more involved with public goods to see how um i don't know just like the different public goods experiments that people organizations um or DAOs and communities are doing um i like keep seeing ethers come up and i'm so excited for you and i'm so happy for you and um and also honestly um it helps me have faith in this community that um, hopefully we can find ways to like effectively, sustainably fund really important projects like public goods, like Ethers.js. So yeah, maybe tell us a little about, a bit about Ethers and then we can jump into your background. Sure, sure, totally. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know what level to target, but it's basically just like a library. It's like a, a bunch of code that makes it much easier to um, think we discussed before about how it's sort of like a, the, like the recipe, like you have a bunch of ingredients in the universe mm-hmm. and rather than having like an individual, like collection of whipped cream, you can, or like all the, sorry, I'm off the map. Rather than having the recipe for whipped cream and having it as part of your recipe, you can just buy whipped cream and use that in your recipe. And that mm-hmm. saves you all that work of doing those, those finer details. So yeah, mm-hmm. it's basically just like a bunch of code that makes it much easier for the next person to not have to write the same code every single time. Um, yeah, uh, I'm not sure what direction or details yeah, yeah. to go into, but yeah. Well, I, I kind of get that. So I, as a non-technical person, I, I know at least I think that a library, yeah, is just like a, a repo of code that people use over and over again, because basically like every web three app, so a dApp would use, could use ethers.js. Is that how it works? Yeah, I mean, every every web app can use Ethers.js. Ethers.js is used by a lot of like server side things that maybe wants to check and keep an eye on whether their accounts balance are changing. Um, it can be used to implement things like MetaMask. MetaMask uses Ethers.js under the hood, so it's just kind mm-hmm. of like it kind of does everything that you need to do with Ethereum. Um, it's basically a bunch of utility functions, but it's like a higher level language, so you're not always writing the same thirty lines of code. You can just write the two lines of code, and it under the hood does those 30 lines of code for you. Okay, so that's exciting. I feel like uh, this is a service in itself that when people have an idea, they don't have to get bogged down with like all of that utility stuff. They can just like use Ethers.js, carry on building whatever it is, like whatever wonderful idea that they were building. Um, so that's really exciting. And so what is like, what was the path to, I think now we've seen, uh, I think Ethers do really well in Gitcoin Grants rounds like this year. I, I'd love to know what it was like for you if you were involved in Gitcoin Grants rounds in previous years. And uh, and then also with the Optimism retroactive funding experiment, how Ethers came out as like the most voted on um, project. And so that's really exciting. I actually, it's kind of funny. I, I think of the um, the way that the Optimism experiment was done. I almost think of it like the Screen Actors Guild Awards, which is, you know, how it's like other actors voting on <laughs> actors. And so the badge holders were, I think like pretty much all developers or like people within the ethereum community um who had like a really good understanding of ethereum and so i i was really excited because i was like oh that's cool to know like the the people who really know they appreciate rick (laughs) um so i was i was really happy about that but yeah so maybe what was like what was the path to 2021 and ethers js for you i mean so for sure like the the optimism uh retroactive was like awesome it was out of the blue like i got a message i got this message saying we want to add you to this thing yada 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 you want to try it out um yeah it was super exciting and i mean like you said it's very exciting to see that other developers 
Like mm -hmm. some of the people I know, some of the peers, it's a lot of them. I just didn't know who they were. And they like all really unanimously really liked ethers. Like it was really exciting. Um, so, I mean, yeah, 2021 in terms of Gitcoin grants as well, like everything's been wonderful. It's, it's, it is definitely all over the map. Um, I mean, there was, I think there was one, one round, I got like $4,000 of matching, which is still like amazing. But then like mm -hmm. another round was $25,000 with the matching. The most recent one looks like it's 15,000. So mm -hmm. like, it's definitely, I mean, every four months that extra money coming in definitely makes it more viable to do open source development because there's definitely, it's one of those things, like when I first started off ethers, you weren't exactly sure. Like for me, it was just like a kind of a fun side thing. It, mm -hmm. I had some ideas I wanted to do. Well, yeah. I can get into more of the details of, of why I came to Ethers in the first place. But in terms of 2021, like Gitcoin grants, even imagine like the first time Gitcoin grants ran. I mean, I remember Scott talking to him at a, um, at a meetup and he told me this thing. And I was just like, yeah, that sounds really cool. The future sounds awesome. Except <laughs> as somebody who's been developing open source software for a long time at that point, I was just like, opposite of whatever optimistic is like not pessimistic <laughs> but like but i like to say the opposite <laughs> is like a realist it's kind of like a right. kind of way of saying like based on my lived experience of like what has been i don't see this panning out how you exactly like it was out. very <laughs> like i love the idea but it, the outcome seemed very bleak and seemed like a lot of effort for maybe nothing was going to come out of it but you know it sounded fun so i like dove in i think even the first round i can't remember what it was man that was so long ago it's craziness 12 rounds that means it's been like three years um wow but I should actually look back and see what the old rounds even were. In my mind, it was probably like a couple thousand dollars. By keeping in mind that at the time I'd made, I'd made zero dollars towards ethers, it was all of a sudden like, wow, I can now afford to like pay rent for a month based off of like open source stuff I did. So if yeah. I can get one free month of rent every three months, I only need to make up that extra like two months and I'm, I'm good to go. Um, so it was very exciting. Uh, I mean, from the beginning, 2021, I think they've done a lot more work just experimenting. That's one of the things I love with Gitcoin. Every time yeah. they're like, well, that's also, I think, why like the numbers jump around a lot um, mm -hmm. because they're like, well, we think, you know, we're experiencing this type of bias. So let's like jam this weird thing in and see what happens. <laughs> and, you know, it, it achieves a lot of the goals, like some things that need funding that weren't getting it jump way up. Mm -hmm. Some things fall down and vice versa. Like every time they try something new, it kind of exposes a new group of people to, to funding that they wouldn't otherwise mm -hmm. have had access to. So yeah, I am really excited. Um, I think I heard Scott, we were in a space for Gitcoin just yesterday, I think. And he was talking about how his hope is that there is this really layered approach, like the stacked approach in terms of funding public goods. And so the idea being that, you know, uh, the way that I look at it, you have like Gitcoin on one end of the spectrum, optimism on the other, in terms of like kind of forward looking with Gitcoin, retroactive looking with optimism, open to the public with Gitcoin, badge holders with optimism. And then you have this huge space in the middle where we could run so many different experiments in terms of public goods funding. And I'm really excited about the NSDAO and the public work, the public uh, goods working group. And so I think, yeah, just like thinking about the, um, I don't know if, I guess it is unpredictable in terms of like the consistency of amounts and things like that. But then hopefully it gets to a point where we can do like a, a a uh, retrospective of 2022 and you're like wow i like literally have like a, a sandwich of funding and it's like a you know like a six layer sandwich and <laughs> so it kind of like evens out um we're gonna have like a lot of food analogies <laughs> I think. <laughs> um but yeah so so i'm really excited about that and and that's really cool too um yeah i mean i absolutely but, think it's gonna be yeah. the case like because the thing is once you're involved in a bunch of different fundings if one is going mm -hmm. up and then going down once like fluctuating if you got three or four of those layered on top of each other you're still mm -hmm. getting that nice basal, like, like baseline, like funding mm -hmm. that, you know, unless you pay for rent and food and, you know, those, those fun things. Um, and I, yeah, I mean, the approach is taken by the two things, like you said, the public versus the, the developer. It's, it's definitely very different. Um, like, uh, yeah, anyways, I'll, I'll let you ask the questions and jump yeah, on. Yeah, next. yeah, yeah. I, I, re <laughs> I really want to, I really want to loop back to maybe we should just do it now we'll just we'll just ask now since we're we're on this wave but um i wonder for you as someone who has gone through it and especially given your experience of being involved in gitcoin grants rounds from the beginning um how do you feel the public is in terms of being uh the group that makes the decision in terms of whether something a, is a public good and and whether it provides value 
Um, so again, like this is why I really think that there's the very two very different approaches. So mm -hmm. I mean, when you just ask a bunch of random people, so one of the things I do find with Gitcoin is it's very very heavily tiered towards teams that have like a marketing group, people mm -hmm. who can spend basically a full time or several hours a day curating and and mm -hmm. grooming their their Twitter account and you know building those perfect tweets and blogs and the well especially even the case of some of the the gitcoin grant uh grantees grants some of the actual like groups of people they're a twitter group and so a big chunk of of their time is actually spent accruing more more contributors um mm -hmm. so i mean that's the one side of it now that said there's nothing wrong with like having marketing and that sort of thing um it does mean that there is Especially, you can imagine a bunch of developer developers, such as myself, who are not business or marketing focused. Uh, I mean, we're at a disadvantage. Or also, I'm just going to like speak for all developers, like yeah. if, uh, not for all developers, but like based on my experience. Also, I would say like business, marketing, and design, and like are not in potentially like the wheelhouse of most developers, and nor should they be. I feel like this with artists as well that. If you are talented, and I think being a developer is kind of the same level of talent as being an artist, and I hope I'm not offending anyone by saying that, but um, I, I do think that it's really incredible. And I don't think that people should have to be expected to like be able to do everything, But and that is like the way that it is, especially in the sense that, you know, to go and create ethers, you literally don't need anyone else, right? Like you can you can like do the whole thing. You, you push a repo to GitHub and it's up and running. Whereas say if I have an e-commerce business, like I have to do all of those other things to sell a single product. And so it's it, then to, I guess like, and then also in terms of like what the public knows and what their experience is, I would do really basic stuff like go to GitHub and, and look at how many, for, like how many times it, Ethers has been forked or how many stars it has and you're like I don't know that I'm the best person to be making a decision on whether <laughs> you know Ethers um, provides value if those are the metrics that I'm using to um, make that decision so yeah there are a couple things but well I, I also feel like you're I, was saying, I feel like you're more cognizant about these because I don't think the average person is thinking even right. that, at that level they're just like <laughs> I was on Twitter and saw this thing and it sounds really cool like they said the word web3 or they said the word nft and I, I really like my crypto kitty therefore um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, cause I, yeah. I, I do feel like, especially like, um, I mean, throughout my entire life, this has always been, I should say my entire life. This is one thing I, I, I discovered trying to do my own startups and that sort of thing is like, mm -hmm. you can have an amazing product, but if you've got terrible marketing, it's not going to sell. Yeah. You can have like the worst product in the world, but if you got good marketing, it's going to like gangbusters, man. So. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> It's, I know it's, this. I know this <laughs> as well through like lived experience, and it is absolute pain. I don't know if every first time founder goes through um, this idea that like it's the product that matters, and then you get to like the second time running, you're like, okay, one hundred, like ninety eight percent distribution, and we're good. <laughs> exactly. Like if we dump ninety eight percent of all of our profits into marketing, then we're gonna like make a ton of money. But if we like yeah. spend ninety percent of our money on making the product better, no one will ever notice. <laughs> Yeah, so I think that's why then on the flip side with optimism and then that experience of having badge holders who are educated, I guess, and have enough context to make that decision. Um, I guess it was like builders acknowledging builders. And I, I don't know if I kind of understood this right from um, kind of what I've read about the optimistic optimism exper experiment and whether they will go on to do like different niches for different public goods and then have badge holders in uh, every area but yeah that makes a lot of sense because then you have like people with the context making the decisions um but then then we get into like discussions of decentralization and how scalable that is so yeah there are there are trade-offs everywhere but i wonder as well just in terms of like talking a bit more about open source and your experience with it um it also i think be useful to just like paint a picture of what the reality really is because for someone who isn't a developer to say like if you get twenty thousand dollars of matching in a grants round i think most people would be like wow that's a lot of money but if people knew that you could go to a fan company and like what your salary at that fan company would be um you know as i think we're seeing this on twitter timelines like to, to make better ads or you know things like that um it really you know public funding has uh, public goods funding has such a long way to go in terms of getting someone like you 
wreck I would say even like halfway to where you would be on a salary at a fan company I mean for um, sure so like <laughs> as a quick like aside so I used to work at Amazon um mm -hmm. so quick aside so I was like developer zero on uh the Amazon Kindle for those who are familiar with it that was like ages and ages ago but so I have friends who are still at Amazon and if you include like their vesting schedule for their stock and where Amazon's gone they're making over a million dollars a year and so it's absolutely insane like well because you can imagine like every six every two years or every year when you get your review you're getting like two years worth of stock that vests slowly and, and ramp up so like it's kind of crazy when they're just when I, when I listen to them I'm like i'm doing pretty good in crypto and then i'm like oh you know what <laughs> if i would have stayed at amazon i probably would be doing better but i'm much much happier like mm -hmm. i don't need that much money uh, I'm much happier, <laughs> like, like having more money in the bank is not like a substitute for enjoying what you do. Um, yeah. I think that get, getting to this, this middle ground where, um, say we're not going to reach the finish line, but like getting to this middle ground where developers feel like it's not a decision between being financially secure, not even like financially well off and being happy and working on yeah. work that lights them up. Or, <laughs> it, or, or even more right specifically, now. selling your soul. Like imagine being a Facebook right. developer right now and being like <laughs> trying to be an ally. And you're just like, I don't think that this is even possible in my current situation. Like mm -hmm. I, I've basically pre-sold out. It's a, uh, I mean, not to speak yeah. bad against Avis or whatever it's called, meta, meta now, but <laughs> Like there's just so much evil the company's doing you see on a day-to-day -day basis. It would be mm -hmm. very hard, but you can imagine people have families, that sort of thing. So they still need to do the job. So, I mean, there's definitely, yeah, anyways, I'm not trying to speak too ill of, of corporate. Interesting. Just thinking about families and I feel like this is with a thing in Silicon Valley as well, but in terms of like the age of open source developers, is there like a trend that basically it's the kind of thing that you can do maybe like during uni, after uni, and then at some point, a few years after that, you have to kind of like get serious and I mean, stop taking such risks. <laughs> I don't know whether I can speak completely generically, but based on what you just said and based on what I'm just thinking through my head, it kind of feels accurate. Um, yeah. I mean, it's kind of like when you're young, you can be that starving artist and you can, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the, the, when I was in Toronto the first few years, I was staying in a place, there was seven of us in a five bedroom. Um, I, I had one <laughs> electrical outlet in my entire room. So I had two plugs and there was no heat in the house. So I, one of the plugs was a full-time heater to keep the room heated up because it was winter. <laughs> and the other plug I had like uh, I'd snaked and taped an extension cord around the wall because there's no light switch or no lamp in the room. So I had like, anyways, it was just like a complete like mess of wires taped to the wall and extension cords taped to the floor so that I could have like a semblance of a light switch even. So that's the thing. When you're young, when you're, you, you don't mind sleeping effectively on the floor and your back doesn't hurt in the morning <laughs> you absolutely have a lot more opportunity to like skimp on on these type of things to focus on just doing some random open source project because you think it's hella cool um yeah but then once you kind of start getting back aches and you can't sleep on the floor comfortably anymore <laughs> and like you know maybe you have like a mortgage or uh, like you're trying to get a mortgage at this point but like once you start getting those like i call them cool couches those things that you really love but are like oh, yeah hard to move um so like once you get like a girlfriend and maybe you're thinking of settling down and having a family <laughs> or that sort of thing like like having kids is a cool couch like you can move them but there's like a, a huge extra cost to take them out of school and move them somewhere else so they're gonna kick and scream and fight and all that sort of thing time. so yes. um it's definitely much easier before you start accruing those cool couches like right out of university you got no obligations you mm -hmm. you might have like that futon you really liked and you want to take that with you. But other than that, you're, you're pretty unencumbered. Um, yeah. So I do agree. I think as you get older, I mean, maybe the starving artist thing just doesn't work as well out of necessity because you're reaching mm -hmm. more of those milestones in life that make it harder. Yeah. Um, in terms of like what then becomes of open source software, does that mean that potentially, you know, I get, I feel, you know, I feel like Nick, Nick Johnson, founder and lead dev of ENS does not get enough credit. Um, and I will, you know, sing his praises all day, but the fact that Nick kind of left Google to work at the Ethereum Foundation and then, you know, as the founder of ENS and work on that full time. And, uh, so I, I don't, like I said, I'm not technical and I don't know, but just watching the stuff that Nick does 
in terms of like the DAO creation and the stuff that he did with the governance contracts and, and things like that, you know, he's just like, oh, this doesn't exist. I'll just do this and then it will be a thing. And he doesn't think anything of it. And and um, and I'm sure he's not normal. I'm sure he's a superhuman. And um, and f- and as a result, like the code base of ENS and, you know, now the ENS DAO will kind of be progressed to places that it wouldn't be without someone kind of of Nick's caliber working on it. And so... And I completely yeah, agree. Do you have I mean, thoughts on that? I mean, so first of all, like huge respect to Nick. Like I, I don't think there's any anyone I respect more than Nick in the space or in developing world at all. There might be people I admire as much, but certainly no one I admire more. Um, so <laughs> it's um, yeah, like it's, and it's a good point. Like it's it's not it's I see this all the time when I talk to friends that work at other companies. You can hear like. Uh, I mean, the example we always use at, at, well, again, this was like an Amazon quote. I'm sure it exceeds, I'm sure it existed before Amazon. This is what I heard at Amazon was that A mm-hmm. players hire A plus players, whereas B players hire C players. Like you, like p- p- people who are like awesome, they want to become more awesome. So they want to surround themselves by better, better people. People who are kind of mediocre, they want to look better. So they hire people below them. I mean. Oh my gosh. I've never heard that before. This okay. is life changing for me. So, so maybe it is like a thing that like. Amazon, I don't know. I mean, this is just like a thing, like, you know, you hear all these things over your life and they just kind of like, like munge into your brain. So I don't know where I mm-hmm. actually heard it, but in my mind, it, it came up one day at some point during Amazon life. Um, and so like, yeah, I mean, Nick is definitely that A plus player. And mm-hmm. it's like having that type of person design a system. There's so many things, like I, I listen to people all the time complain about their their B, B players and C players. And it's just, I'm not trying to put anyone down. It's uh, I'm not saying like it's tiered. You can always learn more. You can always move up from mm-hmm. a B player to an A player. You just have to try and want to do it. Um, yeah. But you just listen to like the things that's going on in the company and the things that they are doing as a manager, like the, the these, and it just feels so wrong. Whereas like I feel like that's the thing, right? With somebody like Nick, he's like, no, we have to do the right thing. Um, mm-hmm. It may mean we launch a week late. But I'd rather release something that's good and mm-hmm. and late rather than on time. I mean, you see this all the time, in like the, especially the video game industry. Like right. EA has these crazy things where if they don't release the game on time, they lose the exclusivity con- like an exclusive contract to produce that game. And so you see these games push through where there's literally the game almost doesn't even start because like the deadline was such an important thing to meet. I mean, right. people still buy the disc and just wait for the patch to make it turn on but so definitely the caliber of programming is because not just the caliber of like it's it's such a, a holistic thing a holistic like holistic medicine but holistic yeah. like the whole of the thing like you need to understand like technical debt like there's so many times where you're just not the technical debt for anyone who's not familiar with the term like you can kind of like imagine duct tape you can duct tape things really together and get it working today but it does right. mean two years down the road that duct tape's going to fail and you have a problem. And now you can imagine if you've done that all over your house, well, <laughs> now two years down the road, it's not just one thing you're trying to like catch up with, but everything mm-hmm. is just collapsing. So, you know, those shortcuts saved you at the time, but they just keep compounding and compounding as you put more and more duct tape on. At some point, the duct tape stops being sticky and uh, yeah. the world just ends for you. So it's, I think that's the biggest thing with people who are like Nick. They can kind of see, like, this is something that I can take a shortcut on. This is something I cannot mm-hmm. take a shortcut on. And it means that you can kind of better manage your time and and make sure that you get the things out on time that you need to. You can kind of Mickey Mouse the things that are going to more or less be throwaway code. Like, it really comes from experience just seeing at, uh, what is it? It's, it's good experience comes from bad judgment. No, what is it? Anyways, there's some there's some quote like that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good judgment comes from experience. Experience comes from bad judgment. Yes, there we go. All right. Yeah. And so I feel like, I mean, in my mind, this is one of the things that, this is just my my theory, but I imagine Nick is the type of person who's just done a ton of things. When he sees a cool mm-hmm. problem, he's tried solving it and he's failed miserably. And so he tried a different <laughs> time. And, and once you've done, once you've failed enough times at every possible thing in the universe, then the next time you go to do it, you fail less. It's kind of like the, like everyone's 10,000 bad games of foosball in them. Once you get those 10,000 games out, then you're just an expert foosball player. 
or practice makes perfect, whichever way you want I to look that. at it. Yeah, anyways, yes, I sorry. love that you used. I love that you used foosball as your <laughs> reference for that. <laughs> um, yeah, well, kind of listening to you talk about it, it almost feels like the opposite. I feel like, especially in Web three, where we're trying to build systems and protocols and code that will, you know, potentially, hopefully, outlive us. And so, to be very, very long term minded, like basically, we're hoping that open source software developers are more long-term minded than people who are in say i'm just going to use like fan companies um and but they're paid less to like do essentially a role that's more important in terms of like what's on the line and so yeah does that make sense i mean it totally makes sense but it's also like a a dichotomy we see all over the place right when you take a look at like even a fan company and you're thinking like wow, that person's making $120,000 a year. They're actually contributing really cool things to the product and the company mm-hmm. as a whole. And then you're like, well, but the CEO, he has made like $14 billion in the same time span. And I mean, I'm not saying the CEO is not useless, but is he like 16,000 times as valuable? Um, mm, for example, yeah. I mean, I feel like you always see like this huge difference between, I mean, you see this even look at like any manufacturing process, right? Like the manager at the top that's just saying we need more ball bearings, they're making yeah. a hell of a lot more money than these people who are probably not even being outsourced to you know exploitation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yes, I've got lots of views on that. So, but <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying it's very common to see this sort of thing. So I do see like a lot. Like the example I always give is Apache. Can you imagine where the web would be today? Like Web 1.0 or 0.1 would be mm-hmm. if it wasn't for Apache Web Server. Like if the only web servers available were closed source, it would be such a different world today. You would not have like all these, it would have been so siloed starting off in the beginning. You wouldn't have all these like interesting CGI gateway, open protocols that people could use. Everything would be a proprietary thing that you would have had to purchase. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. So how do you feel now just on the back of, um, you know, I've seen a little bit of Twitter drama about this idea of Web3 and that, you know, being open and, um, I don't know if there's pushback about, about whether it is better for community ownership and, and things like that. And the fact that it's just like, an al- I don't know if it's an alternative to Web2 in some people's mind, like it's not a whole new version of the internet, but do you think that underplays the value of like current open source software in Web2? Um, I mean, I feel like, so again, this is, I think one of the other issues is what people declare Web3 to be. But to be fair, this existed as well with Web2. Like when Web2 came out, everyone's kind of saying like, oh, you know, it requires Ajax. No, it doesn't do that. Like they all had like their, there was a lot of like disagreement on what even Web2 meant going from, I guess, oh, wow. Web1. Um, so Web3, I, sorry, I didn't quite, so you, you're, you're wondering if it, if it, if it was like a... Oh, I wonder if um, there seems to be like a lot of opposition from people who are in Web2 who are at tech companies and they think that Web3 isn't a real thing and that it's just like a, an open version of Web2, but it's not a whole like version of the internet on its own. I mean, I guess I consider Web2 to kind of not be its own thing either. I actually okay. never liked the term Web2, Web3. Like, it seems, it's just like, I would just say, like, we've added, it's, it's for me, Web3 is just Web2 with extra stuff. Um, I know a lot yeah. of people want to completely throw, like, you know, the, the baby with the bathwater and say, no, Web3 is its own thing. We mm-hmm. still, this is, and this is, for example, one of the things I love with ENS is the idea that we're going to try integrating Web3 with Web2. Like, this, yeah. this, this, like, the idea that, yeah, I guess the example I'll give of this for other developers out there who've experienced this, you write some big piece of software, it's amazing, but like along the way, you you made a bunch of shortcuts and now you have two options, either to rewrite the whole thing from scratch or like kind of like add to your existing thing. If you add to your existing thing, you keep a working product, stuff goes forward. If you decide to rewrite it, you'll be rewriting it till the end of time because you'll just finish the rewrite and you'll decide like, oh, you know, I had to take a bunch of different new shortcuts because I, and so... The idea of just throwing everything out and saying Web3 is its own thing seems absolutely... I feel like if people are underestimating the amount of stuff that is in yeah. Web2, you can't just say Web3 is its whole thing. I mean, even in terms of, of Web2, we were getting to a lot of the Web3 concepts like like, fall, like having distributed servers, like having mm-hmm. having 
large fleets behind a load balancer. I mean, this is very wishy-washy compared to Web3, but like a lot of the Web2 technology is still there. You're still using Ajax. You're still using... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't really know where I'm going with this. It's yeah, I, I guess like the idea is that it doesn't have to feel so competitive, right? It, it, yeah, <laughs> like these two worlds can exist. I think that is like the best outcome. Well, and they're for both everyone. open worlds. Like it doesn't need it doesn't like. This is why I, I feel like you don't need competition in mm-hmm. the for open systems. Like it, it, it doesn't. I would rather see that that resource, all those resources, being dumped into a competing product, into making the existing product better. Because mm-hmm. there isn't that monopoly. There isn't, like, you need competition when there's, you know, the potential for monopoly. When you've got corporations who are, like, clinging to their secrets and just trying to battle it out. But if everyone's already working together, you don't mm-hmm. need to kind of, like, work together with a different group of people just to, like, try thwarting this other group of people who is more than willing to let you, like, kind of, like, run into the fold type thing. So Right. Is that like has that been your experience in terms of being a developer that people generally are really open and inviting and, and things like that? Or... I mean, definitely not. Um, but the amount of resources to do a whole new project is still far more than to kind of like cooperate on a project. Um, right. I mean, no, it's, this is like always. Yeah. Always the interesting thing with open source, which is this idea that it's like people, well, this is funny as well, in terms of being an open source developer, you've been doing potentially asynchronous work with like many people around the world uh, with varying abilities and things like that for probably many years. And like people are coming out of corporate, like out of corporates into Web3 being like, wow, asynchronous work. This is incredible. Developers are like, yeah, uh, okay. I mean, we've been doing this, (laughs) but okay. (laughs) So what has that experience been like and um and just like do you enjoy you know because you do have a point of contrast in terms of um being at amazon like how do you feel about the way that you do work uh right i mean so again like one of the only issues i think with just being like one person is like i I have to do it all and so like i kind of have to Mm -hmm. do it all like there's this whole man like the number of tweets and emails and like random dms and like weird out of channel ways People are mm-hmm. always asking random questions. And so like, there's, I don't have that dedicated like support team like you would at, at a company like Amazon. Um, mm-hmm. So I guess the anecdote I'll give as well is, because uh, I think that actually works well. When I was working at Amazon, so uh, like I said, I was, I was on Kindle. When I first started, there was five of us. And so mm-hmm. as a result, like we got like a chunk of the pie. Like, every one of us got 20% of the stuff to do. So like if we yeah. wanted a web browser on the on the Kindle, we're like, well, let's just throw one together and like see if we can get something working on a system that has no mouse or touch screen or anything. You're just like, right. And so like the thing is, we could just do what you wanted to do and make it a cool next thing. You know, next week mm-hmm. there's a thing that's just awesome. Like you've got like this web browser. It completely sucks, but it works. Um, yeah. So like when I first started, there was five of us. We had so much of the pie. It was just wonderful. By the time I left, I think there was between. A thousand and fourteen hundred people, like it was just like an insane number of people. Um, That's so crazy. Well, it, it, and it's absolutely crazy. Like the whole grow big fast, I just think is absolutely terrible. Um, oh. But uh, as a result, when if, if there was a cool, like I remember at this one point, I had this idea of just um, for people who are there who are developers, just compressing, just just encoding type gzip for the for the content and just on the rough math it was going to save them because amazon was paying all the all, all the data usage for all kindles like that was just part of the the deal and it was going to save between one and three million dollars uh, a month i guess for some time period anyways just in bandwidth costs and so i wanted to do this thing so i kind of like asked my manager who asked their manager and it kind of it took like three months to go up the chain and come back the chain and basically the answer was no we don't want you to do that it's introducing risk yada 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 i mean i added it anyways um, but I would like, but if it would have screwed up, I would have been like, like that would have been like a big issue if it would have screwed up as some other part upstream or downstream. Um, so in hindsight, I probably should not have, but, uh, it's, so it, it, like, it's such a big difference when you're like a small agile team. And so I think that's the biggest difference that people maybe aren't used to is when they're like those special projects, like even like the people working on, on video on demand, that sort of thing in Amazon, it was like a small knit team. They were much more mm-hmm. agile and they had more that asynchronous like type of style of working like you're describing. But 
that works great in a small group, but humans scale terribly. So right. once you're at scale, you need all that bureaucracy just to kind of keep the beast from from falling apart or eating its own tail or that mm -hmm. sort of thing. So, yeah. Speaking speaking now of like scaling and bureaucracy, this feels like a segue potentially. Um, but so we just launched the ENS style uh, in November and something that I think about is that where TNL, True Names Limited, uh, could scale versus where the DAO could scale in terms of getting people involved, putting people in roles and kind of what the end goal is of ENS and the ENS DAO. And uh, it's really interesting to think about because, I mean, I don't think it's really been done. I think that ENS is in a really unique position in terms of um, the kind of potential of the DAO because it isn't, say, a project DAO where you can just say, okay, TNL, you do the heavy lifting <laughs> and we're going to do like all of this other amazing, wonderful stuff, um, but would probably make up for a lot of headcount in a normal company, say. So how do you, like, where are you at, just like personally having been in the space for a couple of years um, and I guess having witnessed like DAOs from the very beginning uh, to, you know, the ENS launch, uh, how do you feel about DAOs generally and what are you excited about and maybe kind of um, ca cautious of or like interested to see play out? Right. Um, I mean, I've actually been fairly much an opponent of DAOs for quite a while. DAOs mm -hmm. to me see, I mean, I love the idea. Um, I feel like one of the things that, why I'm usually concerned with things like DAOs is no matter how good a system you design, no matter what safeguards you put in place, once there's financial incentive to kind of hijack mm -hmm. the system, it will be. I mean, even, even when you look at like, a, like actual real world democracies, like the U S like you see them being hijacked like it's just like a snowball effect you see like these rich people get power and then enact laws that gives them more power which then they mm -hmm. use that new power to enact more law and it's just like this huge snowball effect um so you see this even in in a centralized world where you're supposed mm -hmm. to have all these centralized like different authorities that that protect things and keep things in place but you know you swap out a supreme court person here you swap out a, a few lobbyists there and next thing you know you've got this runaway train um, so that's absolutely one of my biggest fears with the DAO. Like I definitely have some, mm -hmm. some interesting ideas on how a person could attack a DAO. And I'm super mm -hmm. curious to see what's going to happen. Once there, once you can make enough money to cover the attack and make profit on top of it, then you're going to see attacks. Like this is just how blockchain works. We see this all the time with like MEV. Um, once that said, I'm super optimistic and hopeful. Like, Mm -hmm. And actually, going back to the democracy example or the the U.S. system, I feel like any any um, organization like that can be very effective early on. So, mm -hmm. I mean, the U.S. It, it did pretty well for like a, a hundred or so years before <laughs> you know that, that that ramp up really started like escalating. And so, I mean, if if the ENS DAO can go a hundred years or even fifteen with being really good before we have to like you know redesign whatever random uh like new constraints restrictions who knows in 10 years 15 years time like we who, it could be anything like that's just in in blockchain world especially but just in tech yeah. all across the board <laughs> like 15 years if we can survive 15 years in a dao we will have so many more crazier ideas whatever mm -hmm. you know dao 2.0 is going to look like or by mm -hmm. then dao 3.0 where it's like oh we have this ai bot that's uh you know, fully hom homomorphic encryption enabled, and we can be assured that it's operating within, you know, that that's future stuff for us to worry about. So I'm cautiously optimistic right now about a DAO. Um, the token, luckily, is worth enough right now to actually provide financial, like, safety. Mm -hmm. The value of attacking ENS right now is low. So I, I definitely, I feel like, well, and speaking of congratulations, I think you were the one who who got the the work groups. Is that your oh, your yeah. your proposal exactly? Like, I think that, that also me. helps with your description. Like, with the problem you're describing is rather than having one massive team that is mm -hmm. going to like suffer from scaling issues, we have like a bunch of smaller teams for now that can kind of stave off the this the scaling rot. So yeah, 
yeah, I do fear like the, how DAOs scale. And also just like you said, like I feel, I think that a lot of people will be shocked to know that, um, you know, TNL, like the ENS core team, I think was like four people plus, you know, you being heavily involved up until like the start of the year. <laughs> and then um, before the launch, there were like an, another four people that were added in like that say 10 months. And, um, and now we have a, a few more people as well. So, but that's like a really small team. For when you think about ENS and kind of the protocol and the impact and things like that, I feel like that's that's kind of outrageous. When I learned, like I was like, wait, it's just what? Well, and <laughs> um, I, that's and what so, gives us the agility. Yeah. I feel like that's a huge benefit totally. when you're trying to get a lot done quick. So sorry, yeah. I, I cut you off. I didn't mean to. Sorry. No, no, I always, I say this as well when people ask about DAOs and kind of like when to DAO and I all, <laughs> I say that if possible, like DAO as late as possible when you have as much of the product done as you can because I just genuinely don't know how productive um, like a DAO is in terms of building product. And also I have like very limited experience, but I feel like ENS is, is at the point where um, we kind of, you know what it is. Um, and trying to figure that out in a DAO, I think is like especially challenging, but also just in terms of the security aspect with working groups, I kind of think that like, as opposed to having like a whole body where you can just like go for the heart and like take out someone, uh, like if <laughs> each working group is like a limb, um, that, you know, if something goes terribly wrong with, with one working group, um, it doesn't mean that like the whole body is a write off potentially. And, um, you know, so th- it is interesting, like th- those two competing um, thoughts about security and risk and, and things like that. And then in terms of like building and all of the productive stuff. So yeah, that, that's actually really interesting. I'm glad you brought that up about the price because I, uh, I've like thought about it, but I, I think it clearly needs like more thought and I, especially because it's a governance token, like the the tokenomics are, you know, we jokingly, when people ask in Discord, like, what are the tokenomics of ENS? And there are no tokenomics. It's a governance voter. Uh, exactly. Like a governance token. But now that it is a governance vote uh, token and that is the value, it is really interesting thinking about uh, the risk involved in terms of, like, the price and, and things like that. So, yeah, I wonder in terms of things that you think DAOs might be good at, hmm. where do you kind of see space for opportunity with ENS there? Right. So, I mean, well, just to piggyback on one quick thing you said, I think an important part of, of this is making sure you had as much dump as possible before the token, uh, mm-hmm. like before the DAO. Basically, a DAO is going to add friction. I, I feel like I feel yeah. like fi- friction is the – and this is why it's kind of like a pro and con, like you were asking what the benefits of a DAO is. Like, friction is almost a feature. Like, it, it means that <laughs> it, it becomes like a part of the security. Like, if somebody tries doing something mm-hmm. that's just like awkwardly terrible to the system, um, at least there's like – some time and some fight back that we, we can give against it. I think DAOs, mm-hmm. DAOs, again, it depends how it's organized. I do feel DAOs are going to fall a bit subject, like our DAO, the, the ENS DAO. Mm-hmm. I do feel mm-hmm. like it's going to fall subject to the same thing we are talking about earlier with Gitcoin, mm-hmm. where a really good marketing campaign can absolutely get a proposal through that you, you really wouldn't want through. Um, right. It also might have this, the opposite problem where a DAO we really want to get out there doesn't get in because people are able to raise enough FUD about it. I mean, we saw this with Prog POW for, for Ethereum. They want to right. change the proof of work algorithm. It was all the research was done, but a, a group of people who had a lot to gain by not getting mm-hmm. it put in were able to get enough people who didn't really understand the system to say, no, I don't want that. Like they, they, they convinced right. the masses of of fake information. I mean, we've seen this as well in the U S not too long ago. Like, uh, Mm -hmm. it's, so that might be another issue for the DAO is kind of like that marketing thing. But I also think it has the ability to bring in maybe more, more diversity inside the opinions of what gets done. Um, like Mm -hmm. I'm a huge proponent of of diversity. We need it everywhere for everything. And so Mm -hmm. rather than having a bunch of developers sitting around deciding how we should, you know, move ENS forward or what we should do with it, having artists get in there and have their say and having just like a, a big group. Like I'm actually quite impressed with the ENS team. It's, it is already fairly diverse. Like there's a lot of other teams mm-hmm. I jumped in the call with and, you know, it's like 10 of us and we're all white dudes. Um, so <laughs> it's, uh, I'm already pretty impressed with ENS from that standpoint, but it definitely helps 
it, again, it's, it's both directions. It helps in one way in that it makes it possible for diversity to, to jump into the system and make decisions. On the other hand, there's definitely like an economic, um, basically rich people can, can buy clout in ENS with a DAO. Um, right. So you start losing diversity if it decides to become attacked because now basically it's a bunch of rich people making decisions and mm -hmm. now you're back into like a similar, you know, rich people are going to decide how to spend taxes differently than the general population would choose to spend taxes. Mm -hmm. I guess what I'm saying is I don't know. Like I feel like there's pros and cons on both directions. Um, it will be really interesting to see what actually happens as a result. So far, I've been yeah. really impressed. Like the engagement on the ENS DAO has been wonderful. Mm -hmm. Like, and the the conclusions that the DAO has come to, I've been super impressed with. Like, when it comes to, we need to give out money because we made a goof. It's like, well, obviously. So like, ninety nine point nine six percent said yes. Like. Mm -hmm. The re remaining was kind of split evenly between no and abstain. So mm -hmm. it was kind of like, I, I, I've, I've not seen any of the, like every decision that I've seen on the DAO so far that I have voted in favor or whatever, whatever, whichever way I voted was the way mm -hmm. that won. So I don't, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that I'm all knowing and that my directions are correct, <laughs> but I've been very happy with seeing the, the system kind of aiming to be that open and, mm -hmm. Well, the ENS constitution for being very ENS constitutionally aligned. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it has been really, really wonderful to see all of the discussion in the forum. And uh, I, I think as well, just how kind of deeply people do take, you know, the responsibility of what is being proposed. And um, yeah, I, I feel like there seems to be like a lot of thoughtful discourse. And, and I think that in terms of diversity, like, this idea that especially that developers like as a group of people because the ns team is like very developer heavy uh would be the best to say build out a protocol you're like okay that makes sense but then you start to see like you, you could probably see this in the twitter spaces if you've like dropped into an ens twitter space it's so diverse there are, honestly i kind of joked that after one space we should have like a career board or like <laughs> some sort of directory of the kind of work and professions that people who love ens do because it is so diverse it's so exciting and i feel bad for like 15 year old me that like only thought that like account like accountant lawyer doctor engineer were like the four only like, the four professions because yeah the the diversity of lived experience within the ENS community is really cool and I really do hope that we can tap into that because yeah I think that so many good ideas you just like don't know where they come from and I am really grateful as well to you know like Nick and the team for being so open I think that even like going through that DAO process and say with like the blacklisting of um, accounts that were farming and things <laughs> I don't think I don't think people understand that like that happened like in our team chat and then it was on Twitter and it was public like there was <laughs> basically like no amount of time that anything is private with the ENS core team and so uh, I think that that means there's like a good foundation right yeah. for the DAO to build upon in terms of like the openness and transparency and I mean, that's okay. So absolutely. And that's for by far, you, you, like that's the nail on the head, like for sure. I think the biggest advantage is a DAO or the biggest advantage of a DAO is transparency. Like mm -hmm. I, I love the idea, like if corruption is happening, at least mm -hmm. you know about it. Like, like you can absolutely yes. see it. Like, and like going back to like what I said, like any, any organization will eventually be corrupted and taken over. I think the mm -hmm. biggest advantage of a DAO is when that happens, it's much more obvious. Like when you see, yeah. like, like again, I know I rag on the US a lot, but a lot <laughs> of the corruption is like behind the scenes. Like like the amount of corruption mm -hmm. that we know about is just the tip of the iceberg. It is so much worse than, than almost anyone in the world could possibly ever imagine to the point where we can't even imagine. It's like the, the singularity right. of corruption. I mean, we see this in other countries as well. I just, you know, get a lot of US news because we're, <laughs> we're next door. Um, but that's the nice thing with something like a DAO is when that's happening, you're seeing, mm -hmm. well, this person we know has inside information about this thing, and they kind of made a bunch of decisions along the lines of, of that information. They so it's, yeah, transparency. I think is, is one of the biggest advantages of a DAO. Um, if there's people misbehaving, you see them misbehaving very publicly, very very in the open, mm -hmm. and that yeah, means that you I'm can really try shutting yeah. it down. You can try fixing it. You can try 
you can try to do some. So I, I, I overspoke you. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, that's cool. I am. Um, I really believe in that as well. Like this idea that transparency is like the greatest win of what we're doing here. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to kind of see. Uh, yeah, just like also who leans into that because I know it's like not a comfortable position for lots of people for everything that they do to be under. Um, not like scrutiny, scrutiny, but for it to be visible. So yeah, but I just want to check. Do you have a hard stop at, at the hour? No, 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 I'm good. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, and so I wonder now if we could like uh, kind of loop back and I, I know we like went off on a real tangent. Um, <laughs> Sorry. But, uh, if, we, if we can loop back because I don't know if this is like a time where we, we should just tell people that we did record this podcast and then there was an outage that meant that it didn't get recorded. Damn at, AWS. So, <laughs> and so um but i feel like the origin story like your origin story is so interesting and especially i think the like name coin ns thread um is really cool like now to see like how involved you are in ens to see like what brought you into the space so i don't want to tell the story but yeah, do, no can you tell the story for sure i mean i'll try i mean this is the problem with like read with re <laughs> with redoing an interview i'm like well i don't know if i'm supposed to refer to like i told you this before or like da, 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 da. No, don't. Yeah, yeah so i'm trying to think of like i'm trying to remember what exactly what i said or even like a long line i'll just try to like i'll just wing it again and feel free to ask questions okay. that, that make sense to okay. ask um but yeah like when i first got into like so uh i guess going way back like when i first started into bitcoin uh we were at like a game hackathon to, uh, toronto jam toronto game jam just toe jam for short because it's an awesome name <laughs> Shout out, to, uh, shout out to Toe Jam. They're an awesome organization. They do great work. Well, anyways, one of my friends was was attending it with me. And, like, we needed a break because, you know, we've been coding for, for forever. And so he's like, mm -hmm. yo, there's, like, this new Bitcoin, like, ATM in Toronto. I want to go check it out. And so, like, we just took a break. We jumped on the streetcar, at, you know, like, half an hour, 45 minutes, one way, just to go see this, like, Bitcoin ATM, what all the hoopla was about. We, like, walk up to the building where the, where the Bitcoin ATM is, and we can see the ATM, but it's just like some dude's house and so it's like locked and so like we, so we can like look through the window and see the atm it looks pretty cool um but there's like a there's a thing on the door that was explaining like uh you know we have like weekly meetings visit this meetup to like try it so we signed up for the meetup jump back on the streetcar went 45 minutes back and then continued coding until 6 p.m the next day um mm -hmm. so that's kind of what, what started the whole thing is i started going to this thing Bitcoin seemed really cool. Um, the examples of, yeah, I'm just like jumping over the map again. I feel like I've got the story in my head and then I'm trying to peg it where the best parts are. Um, <laughs> so anyways, in terms of Bitcoin, I, I guess the stories I usually give as to why like, I really got into Bitcoin in the first place. Um, again, these stories may or may not be true, but the fact is they could be true. And so just somebody telling me these stories I, I like, like to prefix it, prefix it with like, I may, this may not actually have happened, but the fact is this is possible. And so that's what mm -hmm. makes me excited about, about Bitcoin is that these type of situations kind of go away. Um, so the first is like, there was an online Canadian uh, gambling company, Poker, po Poker Online Canada, whatever. Um, and basically of all organizations in the US, it wasn't the NSA, it wasn't the FBI. Uh, so to keep in mind that this company was following all Canadian laws, it was following all the taxations, all the things it needs to do, uh, except that, it ha so it had a, a dot com. And as a result, not the FBI, not the NSA, not the CIA, no, no, like, like authoritative branch of the government, but the IRS believed that there may exist people that live in the U.S. using this Canadian gambling site to gamble and not pay taxes. So they were able to confiscate the dot com from this company. And you can imagine as like an online poker company, your like domain name is pretty valuable to your like brand. And so like, that was like, that, that for me is like the big example of, of why we need like this to not, this is why the web three type situation, we can't have yeah. the U S we can't have any one country in charge of the internet to the point where they can just take people's domain names away. And so mm -hmm. I got really big into name point at one point, like, Name point was the most awkward thing to deal with. At the time, it was leaps and bounds ahead of anything else. Like, like nothing even came close to name coin. But this was way back in the day. This was like, you know. What was, like, what was the promise of name coin? So name coin was basically you take some, some string and you can just mm -hmm. register it. Like it's now, 
like I had you slash Rick Moo. Like, and that was just it. Like that was my like thing. Um, mm -hmm. No one else could take it. I had to renew it like every six months or something. Like there's so, like, you basically had to make sure it was like within the blockchain within a certain amount. I can't remember all the details, but it was a huge hassle to deal with. And of course, every time you want to do anything with your name, it's been more than a month. If you want to update like the, the text records, you, I think you just attached a JSON payload to it. And it just got like smushed into the blockchain. And when you ever you updated information, you basically just smushed new data in there. But the problem is like back then, even Bitcoin had the same problem. If you hadn't used it for a few months, you had to like download the latest version of the source code. You had to spend a week fidgeting because it used various different versions of boost libraries. You know, it needs boost HTTP this, it needs boost map that. Of course, there's conflicts all over the map. So it takes you about a week anyways to get this bloody thing just built. And then it takes a day <laughs> to sync the node. And now you're finally mm -hmm. at a point where you can like uh, poke around and and actually update the, the values for your name. Like update the, I, well, because it was more akin to like what DNS was. So you could set things like right. the IP address of your servers and that sort of thing. So, I mean, it was a really cool idea having a human readable, like that's the thing. When I like, I think it was in DevCon 2, I saw Nick Johnson present um, ENS and I was just like, oh. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the time I was thinking like, well, this has some some huge holes in it that I think I should compete with and try to do my own thing. Da, 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 da. But no, I mean, once I once I tried it out and I like thought about how much work it would be to try competing against it, and the fact that it would kind of did everything and all the things that I thought were problems that it didn't solve weren't really problems that needed solving, and that it solved right. problems that I hadn't thought about in doing my own mm -hmm. thing. So it's just, I mean, I feel this is like a normal developer like mindset. Like I could do better than that. Until you start trying it out and you're like, well, okay, it's actually pretty good. It's pretty awesome. So anyways, like <laughs> ENS, like ENS just won my heart almost instantly. It was just like ridiculous. Um, this is this is basically one of the main reasons I got into blockchain in the first place was oh. this like ENS was like name coin. Um, uh, so the other quick story I'll, I'll jump into as well. And now again, like how mm -hmm. much how true the story is, who knows? Um, but the story I heard was there was a bunch of Afghani women um, and... Basically, they, they weren't allowed, they're not allowed wealth. They're not allowed having any money. If any money they have belongs to their brother or their husband or their father, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And so the idea that these women could just basically memorize like a seed phrase and go out into mm -hmm. the world and sell their textiles and like accrue wealth. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's a very empowering idea. Like you take people in like a super pressing. Now, mind you, that money is of no use to them today. Like having wealth in a world like that is not useful, but you could imagine if something mm -hmm. comes along, I mean, I'm not speaking a huge in favor of the crown prince, but if you have like a crown prince like type moment where uh, women are all of a sudden given autonomy in a world mm -hmm. that's been like this, those women would not actually be able to do anything. If you have no money, it doesn't matter if you're now given the right to own property, you can't afford to own property and you're still very like mm -hmm. oppressed in that, that type of society. And so the idea you can imagine if a crown prince type event happened and also women were permitted to do this, you could imagine, well, now they can take their Bitcoin out and all of a sudden they can move out. They can like start sheltering their friends who maybe couldn't afford it. Like they can buy food. They like it for me, like Bitcoin seemed like this idea of like being able to empower people in a world where there wasn't even the option. Otherwise, like you can't like, other than hiding gold coins under your pillow or something. And, it's this magic thing where you can just in your brain, I mean, I said, I wouldn't want to memorize a, a mnemonic seed, but, <laughs> but in your brain, if you were, if you're in a, in, if you're in a position where you absolutely have to, in order to have yeah. money, you will for sure be able to memorize 12 words. Like, I mean, back in the day, we used to remember our ICQ numbers. Like we had all these, like, for people who are too young, ICQ was kind of like <laughs> a messaging app. Think of WhatsApp. But you were just given some random number when you signed up. There was no like, or phone numbers. There you go. People remember their phone number. So, I mean, if you were really inclined to do so, you could absolutely remember um, a mnemonic seed. So, anyways, that's kind of what got me into, uh, into the blockchain in the first place. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. That's, um, I feel like those are two, like, examples that are still, it's actually kind of funny because that would have been a few years ago. And like those two examples are still really relevant in terms of the f like the sense that they 
I think like things haven't been completely solved, but also those uh, those examples. I think as more people like understand, you know, like that dot com example in particular. Um, and I know that you know we just went through uh, Facebook changing its name to Meta and like repossessing essentially like an Instagram handle off. Uh, exactly, user. that's a great example as well. Right. <laughs> so um and then kind of just like uh, through the examples that we see in real life being able to say okay well that happened and this is how ens is different um which i think maybe like the the biggest misunderstanding there is that not that the ens not that ens uh wouldn't do it like w- wouldn't do that repossessing an ens name they can't like you cannot yeah. do it no one can do it <laughs> and so i think just like understanding that is such a shift like it's so mind-bending that there isn't like some person at a keyboard like at the top of the pile or something that like has the ability to hit delete well because um, you saw a few days ago <laughs> adidas they they mm-hmm. people are having problems with their nft and like there's they their support said you should contact the ethereum people because we don't have access to your account <laughs> and it's just like it's such a it's such a different paradigm like no 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 you are the account holder like you <laughs> the person with the private key are the only person you can contact if you have problems so yeah. it's it's really cool that like even ens if they decided tomorrow to be if the if the dao was completely co-opted right wouldn't matter because my name is still safe like yeah, the the worst they could do is raise the price, and I have a five day notice if that's going to happen. And so if I see right. some some crackpot out there like dump <laughs> billions of dollars into buying up the ENS DAO so they can vote a terrible uh, uh, price oracle, and I have five days mm-hmm. to decide, you know what, I'll dump like sixty dollars in and, and buy whatever that is, twelve years, I guess, a uh, hundred dollars. We'll, we'll give it twenty years or whatever, like. Like the fact is, like there's there's checks and bounds, and literally no one can take it away from me. I'm not worried yeah. about like the ENS team launching a new Meta product and taking Meta away from me because they I don't have Meta. But that idea, like, <laughs> it, it, it's absolutely yeah. crazy to me when because I was actually surprised when Twitter Spaces launched that there mm-hmm. was somebody who actually had spaces or something like that as their as their handle i was actually shocked right. that twitter didn't take it like that was my first thought not that like that's a, that would be a terrible thing my first <laughs> thought was wow they, they I was even more surprised with the person only had six followers and they still only had six followers i expected more people to like follow them just by accident by doing at spaces um so it's absolutely a thing that happens in the real world like we do see mm-hmm. people hijack or commandeer other people's names um especially like yeah going back to facebook good grief um it, it, it just <laughs> it's it's mind-boggling that that this is a thing that people just put up with and they, it makes it in the news for a week and then you just kind of forget and you go off and you get your own name thinking oh you know alicia and eve i'll be safe forever until mm-hmm. you know some new amazon competitor comes out called alicia and then all of a sudden mm-hmm. like your leash.com is like basically commandeered or you know yeah it's it's a crazy world it is really sad that that's our expectation like we but it's interesting because i feel like it kind of is our expectation in one way but i also feel like the idea of ownership that we have in terms of the physical world and web too so i think that it kind of doesn't compete with this idea of ownership in web 3 which is like this idea of like you know your private key and like you really are the ultimate owner as long as you have your private key and it's real i think it really takes a bit of time to for for that to fully sink in and i know that i'm not completely there yet that i i'm like only just starting to see now in terms of like comparisons with the real world or web 2 i'm like oh no that's not ownership like it's really it's absolutely true no i mean i agree with you like like um i guess and that's the thing i defining web 3 is difficult but i do think that's one critical part of it um, I mean, I think the easiest way to really get a feel for the difference between Web 3 and Web 2 is, I'm not sure if you've signed up for it or not, but have I been pwned.com? It's just like a website. What is that? It's like an awesome website. It's run by some security company anyways. I mean, it's, it's they, they sell a product. I don't know what it is. But you just sign up, for, you give them your email address, and you just get like an email every couple months, um, not in a good way. Basically, they email you whenever your email address has been discovered on some exploit list that's been sell that's been like discovered on the, on the dark web or whatever. And so like, yeah, every, let's say month or so, it'll be like a, you know, 
a database has been found with over 35 million entries and your email address mm. and hashed password was among the entries in this database from some oh 2019 uh, attack on the milk database. Uh, mm-hmm. And once, like every couple of months when I get that, I'm like, that, that makes me more thankful for like Web3 type like infrastructure. Cause I'm just like, right. that doesn't happen. The only thing they would have in their database would be my address and maybe an encrypted payload. Like there's so many ways you can, you can provide the web to experience with an account that no one else can, can ever, no one else. Can, so people can obviously target me and attack me or steal my laptop or whatever, but that would be a targeted attack. The problem with like the biggest right. problem with the web two world is when you attack a site, you're getting 37 million accounts of, right. of which probably at least 10% reuse passwords across sites and that sort of thing. And so mm-hmm. The the economic incentive to do that attack is very high because even if I can only steal $1,000 on average from 10% of 37 million people, that's a yeah. pretty high threshold for me to hire some dude to kind of like break into into a, a server and steal a database. Yeah, so absolutely. I, f- I feel like this is a th- maybe the thing with Web3 that the normal consumer and user doesn't understand, which is that we see the tip of the iceberg in terms of the UX, like the user experience with Web3. And we don't, it takes like a lot to just like stick your head under the water and like see how, how big it is, like how far, how deep it goes in terms of how different it is. And I think also that is just like a user of the internet is really different to Web2, which is like, I have no incentive I, I don't think i've ever really cared like what stack is facebook running like what happens to my gmail account like, well and what you, does that even mean you don't until you're meta <laughs> right and somebody comes along <laughs> and takes your name and then you just feel so i mean and that's the thing it does not happen to a lot of people it, like it, but mm-hmm. the idea that it could happen at any point in time like even you can imagine if gmail imagine if tomorrow gmail gets taken over by some other ceo who's just like doesn't care and he's like, well, now every mm-hmm. Gmail account is going to cost $10 a month. No ifs, ands, or buts. Imagine how many people are basically being held ca- captive at that point. Like, if you, if, like, there's so many people out there who have their businesses and that sort of thing, and, and, and contacts they don't contact often. Like, switching email mm-hmm. address is, like, tragic. Like, it, yep. updating a phone number is bad enough, but imagine if all, if you update your, like, all of a sudden, you can't maybe log into Twitter. You can't reset your password on Twitter. Like if, if mm-hmm. Gmail is gone, you can't reset your password. You go to some website, your tax software website at the end of the year, and you right. don't remember your password, and you can't reset it because you had to lose your Gmail because you weren't paying the $10 a month. Like, like it's not so much what has happened is what can happen. And so, right. I mean, it's, it's true. I, I don't think twice about a lot of things. I'm just, and this is the mm-hmm. Web 2 world. We're so used to the, reset my password button is just going mm-hmm. to work. And I think this is the biggest paradigm shift for a lot of people is like, this is why social recovery is going to become very important because mm-hmm. people are used to reset my password. If I only log into this website once every two years, mm-hmm. I still want to be able to log in in two years time or even two months. But excuse me, if I don't remember my password, yeah, there's like, you, yeah, I mean, sorry. In my mind, it's just so cohesive. Like this idea of like, yeah. like a, a sign in, like that's why I am super excited for like sign with ENS. Like I love the idea of just like, no, no, no. Click, one one click, oh, yeah. done. I, I'm, I, as long as I- use the official name, which is sign in with Ethereum. Oh, what, oh, is it, oh, is it sign in with Ethereum? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I remember but, reading like a thing about it a while ago, but I wasn't exactly sure what, but I mean- Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think they just like, they, they just like merged the, the, they merged something and now that now people can use it and there are websites um out there now that are already have already implemented um sign with ethereum and it is i just did it last no this week last week and it was the best experience it was so wonderful well it's all but in a lot of things you don't get to witness you don't even get to witness the fact that they don't have your data on their server to be hacked they don't have yeah. a password sitting on their server that you were going to type into like everything is done on your side so mm-hmm like the idea of, I haven't actually tried using any sites for you. I haven't seen it, but I mean, I'm looking forward okay. to it. Yeah. Send me, send me links. Okay. I'm going to send you a link to Clarity.so because they, they have ENS integration and sign in with Ethereum and it's so, you're just like, wait, is, if this is the future of the internet, sign me up. And, and like, there's no, like, <laughs> like, it's just like, everything is just so seamless. You like see a thing, you click a thing and you're in. There's no like, mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Like, yeah, like, I'm at a loss of words. It's just so, that for me is the biggest advantage of Web3 is, is this yeah. sign-in aspect of a key that I own. Now, that said, like, that means that if I ever lose my private key, um, <laughs> crap. But I'm also really well incentivized to not lose it because it also has a bunch of money in it and that sort of thing. That's and true. It's also nice because it's one thing I back up. Like, I'm not, mm-hmm. so, like so for example, the way that I, my storage system set up, I mean, I have like a hard drive in my safety deposit box and one at home and I back up every hour on the hour to the one on my computer. And then once a month, I'll take that one to the safety deposit box and switch it around. Um, wow. My mnemonics, they're all, I bought this like, pvc card stamper so you know like oh, yeah. you know like the raised letters on your credit card so i have like yes. i have a pvc like plastic credit card style thing with my my mnemonic punched on it so it won't fade over time the ink's not going to wear out mm-hmm. like it's waterproof you know so i mean i've gone through a lot of effort to really mm-hmm. make sure that my private keys are saved and stored somewhere safe but the nice thing is i just have to do that once and that's now where i can store yeah. my money that's where i can store my login for the internet you know, if the world ends, if I get like hit by a bus tomorrow, cryonically frozen and woken up in 10 years time, I'm confident I just need to go to find one of my like PVC cards and dig it out the storage and I'll be able to log back into my Gmail account, which is very important um, in 10 years time. <laughs> I'll have so much email. Uh, um, yeah, that's really, an, I, I can't believe I haven't thought about this before, but like the fact that you're incentivized to like uh, look after your private key and uh, because you have money in it because it's a wallet whereas like with a normal password I am definitely don't care about yep. that, them as much as I should because there is like no money attached like there's no financial asset attached to it so it's amazing how just like just that um, by it's like nature makes means that like we're more um, incentivized and aligned to look after it and kind of treat it with the care that you know the at the I mean, everyone has a family member who uses password one, two, three. Yeah, yeah. Like, basically everyone. And so, um, Which is actually not too bad. Like, if their password is password one, two, three, at least now it's in MetaMask on their local computer. Like, you, you, you get right. that implicit second factor <laughs> because you need this computer and password one, two, three, as opposed to, no, no, yeah. if I can guess password one, two, three, I can get into your account. Like, Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's really exciting. Well, thank you so much, Rick. I have really enjoyed talking to you. Yeah. I'm so grateful that we get to work together um, and that you love ENS so much because... ENS is like, it... yeah, I, I honestly cannot like <laughs> praise ENS enough. I like I even have like, so I, I think I'm quoted on on my, uh, I've, I've got some talks. Yeah. Basically, like if Ethereum completely failed and the only thing to come out of the entire Ethereum experience was ENS, I would consider Ethereum to have been a, like, a wild success. Like ENS is the thing we need payment processing, like smart contracts, that's all really cool. But like, e- like a actual meaningful decentralized like naming service, um, epic. Mm-hmm.